Mother's Day. I'm just going to go ahead and get started like I normally do as people kind of settle in and get seated, mainly because people are watching on Facebook and they're already settled in and seated and they're going, what's going on? We're late. So again, happy Mother's Day and we're going to have a presentation for the moms here in a few minutes. I'm going to go through the announcements real quickly and um, let's see, Asa? Would you go back and catch the lights? I've got a video, minute-long video. That'll get people's attention. All right, just a reminder this week, there's a, a crusade starting Monday evening at 7 o'clock, and I have a short video that kind of talks about that. So maybe not. Maybe not. All right. You want to mute it, Josiah, and I'll fiddle with the thing down here? All right, you want to try it again? All right, so we do and B. Okay, I'm going to unplug it just as soon as I have microphone. Okay, we're, no, we're moving on. Turn lights back on. That was fun. Here, mute mine for a second. Just I want the microphone back. Okay, all right, there it is. So that was supposed to be a video. Those guys, that's the guys are going to be presenting. Uh, the guy in the middle was the speaker. Let's see if I can go back to that real quickly. The guy in the middle is the speaker. The two guys on, this, on the side are going to be singing either with him or by themselves. I'm not sure how that's working out. Uh, but that's going to be at uh, Loberg Park starting Monday evening at 7 o'clock, and it'll be Monday through Friday. All week this week at 7 o'clock, and that is an evangelistic event, um, very highly so. This guy is from Dryersburg, Tennessee, I believe is where he's from. Um, so he's going to be bringing the word um, at 7 o'clock each evening. So invite your unchurched and lost friends to that. They do say bring a lawn chair to that. Um, Debbie? It's rain or shine. There's a big tent there. Thank you, Debbie. Yes. If the video had made enough noise for you to hear, you would have heard that, but it didn't work. There is, they're having a, there'll be a tent there, so just show up at Lowberg Park and look for the tent and, and bring a lawn chair or plan to stand for however long they do it. All right, um, Friday, uh, that's this Friday. So the, the ladies will not be able to go to that unless they really hightail the horseshoe bend and back. At, uh, ladies are going to meet at Ashflat Library. And then go from there over to Horseshoe Bend for pizza. That'd be Friday evening. You're going to be doing that. And then next Sunday, we will not be meeting in here. That's important for you guys that might come here. It's also important for you guys that are watching online because we are not going to even attempt to do any, any online services next week. So we will only be meeting at Tohai Park, which if you're not familiar with the area, you can ask one of us, but it's basically it's couple miles from here between the emergency room and the airport, um, and uh, it's got a nice little pavilion there. We'll meet, and we're going to have uh, some lunch and an outdoor service. There's a trail there for people to walk on, and for those of you that, those of you that are concerned, we've done this before at a different park. This park does have good bathroom facilities, which is why we're using this park instead of the one we used to use. That's next Sunday, and that's going to be at 10 o'clock. So uh, be there at 10 o'clock. So it's a little bit different time than what we normally do here, but that gives us more time to hang out together there and eat lunch. 
Um, there, I don't know who's in charge of food. Um, I would suggest asking uh, Susan or Donna or Debbie. Um, find out, find out from one of them, because. All right, so those of you watching online, Howard is saying he'll send out a list for uh, side dishes, but we're the church is providing the hot dogs and hamburgers. Uh, okay, so I'm going to let Howard come up here now and give us our missionary focus and open us in prayer. All right, we had Brad Wass here last week, and that was a great, we had a great time with him. Uh, we enjoyed the host of the So he asked us to pray for the men's retreat this weekend in Columbia, Missouri. EFCA international church leaders and Asian church leaders are uh, together at a retreat even as we speak. He asks also to pray for Claudio, our Hispanic church planter for Springdale, Arkansas, as he arrives from Chile on May the 25th. And then pray for my awesome wife, Patty, as we celebrate Mother's Day by staying home for a family meal and not traveling on Sunday. He is on the road almost every week. And uh, so let's pray for Brad and Patty. And I always enclose their email address and their phone number at the bottom of the page for the missionary that's being featured. And if you think of it during the week, just jot them a, a little note saying thank you. Uh, for serving us and uh, representing us uh, in church planting in several states here. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for Brad and Patty. It was good to get better acquainted with them last week. Uh, he's a very busy fellow, and I just pray that you will really bless and encourage him and Patty and their family. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. All right, we're going to start out with the battle belongs to the Lord. And I will tell you that Josiah and Phil especially <laughs> have been deep in battle this morning. <laughs> and so uh, the sound seems to be working well now, and we give all praise to the Lord for that. So let's stand and uh, glorify God with our voices today.
just take a moment and bow our heads and pray. Lord, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for the rain that we've had and then the sunshine uh, that we're having right now. And I just thank you um, uh, just for blessing us with a beautiful day. I pray, Lord, that we would just really uh, tune our hearts to you this morning, that we wouldn't let things distract us. I pray right now for our musicians. They've worked really hard, um, and there's just been a lot of difficulty and a lot of stress. And Lord, uh, when we stand up here to lead the congregation, we're, uh, we're trying to be extensions of you. And Lord, I just pray that you would have victory in this battle this morning that we've faced. And Lord, I pray that uh, we would just uh, fix our eyes on you and that we would glorify you and that we would rejoice in our struggles and that we would uh, rejoice in the opportunity to worship you through our music and with our voices and with these words. And I thank you uh, that you just move in our hearts in a special way when we praise you through song. And so I pray, Lord, for each person here, whether they feel like they're a good singer or not, I pray, Lord, that they would just worship you, that the words of these songs would just impact their hearts, and, Lord, that it would uh, just point them to you. Because, Lord, that's the, that's the whole point of this, is to just worship you and to be thankful for what you've done, to have our hearts humbled before you so that we're ready for correction, so that we're ready uh, to honor you in our lives. And Lord, I just pray right now that we would just all collectively do that, that you would be glorified this morning in our worship. Pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Our next song is Blessed Be Your Name.
Is taken directly from Psalm, I think, 51, 10 through 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. longer one. Well, uh, I want to divide this congregation. What day is today? Mother's Day. And uh, maybe half of us here are mothers. 
So if you're a mother and you know you're a mother, I'd like you to come up front. Oh, okay. Hello, check. Holding a bit noisy. So, all right. Hello, test. Test ready. Hello. Yeah, yeah, face. <laughs> yeah, there's space over here, ladies. A couple of you ladies can come over here. Don't need. I hope none of you are embarrassed. I think your children have sufficiently embarrassed you in your lifetime. Asa has something special to give each of you here. Get a lovely rose. Reflection of you and your, and your beauty. No? <laughs> well, let me just mention to you ladies that you, believe it or not, are the most important people in the world. You're more important than the president. You're more important than kings. You're more important than anyone who has ever lived. You are part of that group that without you, there would be no life on the earth. The <clears throat> You are all daughters of Eve, who was the mother of all living. And uh, that's a very special place. You know, if, if Eve... If, if, uh, Eve had not sinned, if Adam had not sinned, they would have had forever life. Adam would be living among us today. And so that was what Adam was created for. If Eve had not been created, only Adam would be living today. Have you thought about that? None of us would be here. And just think of all the training that has gone in to all of the children that have populated the world. Some good, bad, some bad. I like the verse in Proverbs 22, 6, in my King James Bible, and also similar in the NIV, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, uh, it will not depart from him. That's, uh, that's actually not translated quite correctly. It's train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, it will not depart from him. But the King James says, train up a child in the way he should go, and he will not depart from it. The correct rendering should be, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, the training will not depart from him. That's, that should bring a lot of comfort to a lot of mothers who have done their best. They have literally laid down their lives for their children, and as their children got older, they seem to have wandered away from the training of the, from the Lord. But the scripture says that training will not depart. It doesn't mean they will inevitably follow the Lord. It means that training will not depart from them. D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, would often say in his meetings, uh, men, you are out there wandering, and you remember the training you received from your mother. Now, take hold of that training now and come to the Lord. And many men responded to the gospel because of the training they had received from their mother. It did not depart from them. And he appealed to that, often appealing on the basis of the mother's love. We, we bring you up here to honor you, not to embarrass you. We bring you up here to honor you. You are very special. You are the most important people in the world as daughters of Eve, the mothers of all living. And so we want to thank you. I want to say a few more words, but I wonder, very quickly, I'm going to 
bring the microphone over, and if, if each of you could just say, this is what I remember most about motherhood. We'll start with Melissa, she's experienced, or Bonnie, she's very experienced. What's your highlight? In a very simple way. Had a whole bunch of them, five of them. <laughs> oh, um, I just, uh, I just am filled with joy. I really am. Oh, I, I think I remember them always saying, "Mama, Mama, 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 Ma, Mama." I remember that too. I remember dragging my little kids all over the mountains of South America, and they loved it more than I did. Just watching them grow up and do their school activities and band and ROTC and all. I just enjoyed. I had two boys, and I enjoyed them with all their friends that came all the time. I was off on Mondays. Every Monday, they all came to my house to eat. All their buddies. We had a lot of fun. My mother baked bread. And when she baked bread once a week, all the neighborhood kids would line up at the back door for a slice of bread. <laughs> I just remember that it was never dull around. <laughs> you never knew what to expect. Uh, I remember all the work that it was, but I love the joy now of seeing them grown up. Did you hear a common word in, in this, uh, these testimonies? Joy? Proverbs 31 says that uh, she has a smile on her face. She is joy She's joyful. And uh, that's wonderful for mothers. Um, <clears throat> as I said, I want to read something. <clears throat> So bear with me. A mom's worth is inestimable. What is a mom worth? Since you're sitting down, I can tell you. The occupations compiled by one salary calculator, the leading salary calculator in the United States, may shock you, pleasantly or otherwise. But think, moms provide transportation, help with direct yard work, assist with homework, including lesson planning and teaching if you home educate. They develop one-on-one -on -one relationships with each of their individual children. They do laundry, facilitate outreach, support the family economy, especially if you're living on a farm. Being available in big and little ways, always, 24-7. Train in growing children, personal habits, order and clean the home, provide outside enrichment and socialization, Cultivate important friendships, cooking meals, facilitate time with beloved grandparents, maintain order and discipline, keep the family on schedule. Not to mention dispensing homemade medical remedies and nursing care, attending meetings and functions, listening to and resolving family problems, helping manage family and personal finances, and caring for pets. A salary calculator by this agency determines a mother's worth in dollars in the job market. So just how much is a mother worth in a practical way facilitating family life? As a teacher and mentor, in keeping the family healthy, physically and emotionally, putting a price tag on a priceless job is extremely hard to do. But salary.com, the leader in compensation data, gave it a shot anyway. Salary.com selected a handful of jobs that reflect a day in the life of a mom, like plumbing, electric, and children's training and counseling, and using their salary wizard, they uncovered that the medium annual salary in 2018 for a mother is $162,000.581. Ladies, your salary is at least $162. You'd like to see some of that, I'm sure. But just how, how much is a mother worth spiritually? If you are striving to live these out with the help of the Lord, you are a mother worth even more. Priceless beyond telling, and a mother worth far more than any amount of money or things. Here is a noteworthy few from Proverbs 31. 
She brings her husband confidence and good, not harm. She endures labor and weariness. She is a sturdy woman. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. She wears strength and dignity. She is joyful at the future. She has wisdom and faithful instruction, spoken and unspoken. She inspires her children. Her husband praises her. She fears the Lord. So instead of believing that you are just a mom, I pray that you, dear mother, would see the priceless treasure you are and the opportunity that you hold in your hands before it is too late with your children. You may not believe or see it now, but trusting God through the struggle will ultimately bless your family more than any other single thing that you could ever do. Stand firm. Do not fear. Trust in the promise of the Lord. Proverbs 31.28, her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her. So don't call your husband over to the computer screen to see how much you're really worth financially. A good employee doesn't tout their worth to the company executives. Allow the Lord to show your husband your true worth, and your children too, both financially and spiritually. J.R. Miller puts it this way, as a blessing and a challenge. O oh, mothers of young children, I bow before you in reverence. Your work is most holy. You are fashioning the destinies of immortal souls. The powers folded up in the little ones that you hushed to sleep in your bosoms, even last night, are powers that shall exist forever. You are preparing them for their immortal destiny and influence. Be faithful. Take up your sacred burden reverently. Be sure that your life is sweet and clean before the Lord and before people. That's a blessing from J.R. Miller. Now, here's where maybe some embarrassment comes. <clears throat> A little card for you. Which of you has the most children? Bonnie, how many children do you have? Children. Children only. Five children. Anyone else have five? You have five. That makes it tough. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So, Bonnie, I guess you're a little older. Is that right? <laughs> no, keep standing there. Okay, who has the most children and grandchildren? Count up your children and grandchildren. Twelve grandchildren, so that's 17. Okay. Can you beat that, Melissa? <laughs> Ellen? Dottie? So, 15, 17. Is that three all together, or three children? That's four. Oh, that's three. Okay. Have you been counting? Four children and grandchildren. Donna? Yep. Well, I guess this goes to Bonnie. Okay. Are you willing to say who is the oldest grandmother here? So I guess it's six years old. Bonnie? Okay, so you're the oldest mother here. Okay, who's the youngest mother? <laughs> Melissa? <laughs> okay, I don't know how this works. Uh, who is the newest mother? 
What's the youngest child, not grandchild, youngest child you have? That'd be what? Ah. Grandchild. Uh, we do have, are you, are you a, a proxy mother? All right, so you're the newest. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> so, uh, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, that training will not depart from him. I want to bless you, ladies. Thank you for being mothers. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being faithful. Lord, we thank you for each of these mothers. We do ask your, your, your rich blessing upon their lives. And do you promise to them a hope and a future? We thank you for their sacrifice, for their faithfulness, for their love that they've given uh, without limit. And we pray, Father, that you will bless them, that you'll strengthen them in the days ahead, and you'll reward them abundantly for all that they have done for you. We understand that they've raised children for the Lord in the name of the Lord. And we thank you for each child and each grandchild that is represented by these mothers. And we do pray that that training would bear fruit in the days ahead for the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies. God bless you. Oh, I'm sorry. Stay here. Come back here. Come back here. That's, I was saving Asa for this point. Please, you come up here and stand here. He's going to read Proverbs 31 for us. Representing each of your children. Proverbs 31, 1 and 1031. The words of King Lemuel on Oracle that his mother taught him. An excellent wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax, and with willing, willing hands she is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her, her food from afar. She rises while, is it, while it is yet night and provides food for her household and fortunes for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She dress, dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff, and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellent but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her work praise her in the gates. Thank you, Asa. And please show your appreciation for these mothers. God bless you. And 
And remember, there are some mothers among us who are not able to be up here, so bless them too. Thank you. Thank you, Roger, for putting that together. And um, thank you, moms, for standing up here for all that time. Now you can sit down and relax for a few minutes, right? So today is Mother's Day. And, you know, I've, as I, I think I said the last week or week before, I was going to get back into James today. And in fact, as Roger was talking to me about what to do for the moms today, I said, well, you can read Proverbs 31 because I'm, prob- I'm, just, I'm planning to go into James today. I'm not planning to do a Mother's Day message. Part of that is, you know, the, you know if this is on my 10th or 11th Mother's Day message, and there's a temptation for me to just kind of recycle some of those old ones because it's been a long time since you've heard them. I can reuse them, right? Um, but I don't really like to do that. Um, and Mother's Day is kind of a it's kind of a narrow topic, so it's difficult to to come up with something original for each each Sunday, right? But uh, as you can see on the screen behind you and in your notes, that I opted as I was praying this week. In fact, I had already started on James and was getting a good good uh, start on that. And as I was praying, I just began to sense that God was saying, "No, you need to you need to go back to Mother's Day, and you don't need to recycle something that you've used before." That being said, some of your notes are from a, a previous message that I did on Proverbs 31. Uh, but uh, I just I felt like it, it was important in our in our day when we are we're a society that's increasingly hostile towards anything that smacks of traditional gender roles or identity. It's more important than ever to recognize the women who gave birth to each of us and to those also who took the responsibility of training them up, because they're not always one and the same. I want to recognize that, because we do have adoptive mothers, and they need just as much recognition as birth moms, because they have taken on that mantle themselves. So as I speak to moms this morning, I want to be sure that I am not only talking to moms who actually gave birth to and raised their children, but also to those who are rearing children or who have reared children who they did not give birth to. So today, many are working hard to eliminate all the differences, the unique differences between men and women. Surgeries can and hormones can make a man look like a woman. But there's one thing science hasn't figured out yet, but I'm sure they're working on it. A man cannot give birth to a child. A man can look like a woman and can act like a woman, but he cannot, cannot give birth to a child. It is the unique design of God for women to have that role. God's design, I appreciate Roger bringing out Adam and Eve there at the very beginning of the Bible. That was God's design in creation from the beginning. So it's fitting that we honor moms this morning. Though not everyone here or watching online um, has been able to give birth to a child, every last one of us was born of a woman. Even Jesus himself has that distinguishment. You ever think about that? You and Jesus have that in common for sure. You were both born of a woman. Part of God's design for humanity, for a man and a woman to unite in a lifelong monogamous relationship through marriage and come together to bear children. Now it's true that the pain of childbirth is a result of sin's curse. Childbirth itself, however, is a blessing from God. In Psalm 127, Verses 3 through 5, we find these words. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior 
are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. The psalmist here says, children are a heritage from the Lord. That is to say, they are literally a possession granted by Jehovah, the gift of Jehovah. The woman who carries such a gift from God for those months of discomfort and inconvenience has a unique place in God's work of blessing. Now Solomon is credited with penning this psalm, and his quiver was certainly full. Think about this, though. He says, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. That's a verse for fathers, isn't it? Now, obviously, it applies to both fathers and mothers. But if, as it says, the fruit of the womb is a reward, there's an extra blessing here for the mother. Now, we're told that we must be responsible in our decisions regarding the number of children we have. And while it's a decision that each family must make for themselves, based on a myriad of factors, the Bible is clear throughout its pages that children are a blessing from God, not to be discarded like some mistake. Now, fathers certainly play a a significant role in the development of children beyond just conception. But mothers have a different kind of connection, having provided the facilities, if you will, for the child to grow and develop before it can ever survive apart from its mother. And even after that, the mother is uniquely designed to provide vital nourishment and even vitamins and antibodies essential to the early growth of a newborn baby. The mother definitely has a powerful role in one way or another, in the life of every human being. Now this perspective emphasizes more the reward a mother is to a child than the child is to a mother. But sometimes mothers need to be reminded of the reward children are, especially young mothers, because young children, at times, can be a trial that make moms wonder about that. But even adult children can do that at times. As most mothers continue to fret over their children long after they grow up, move on, and start families of their own. Am I right? We have a lot of those moms in here right now. And they're all nodding their heads in agreement. The most significant impact a mother can have on her children is a spiritual impact. Now, Obviously, this assumes that a mother loves Jesus and trusts in him for forgiveness of her sins, but if even one that doesn't care about spiritual matters has an impact on her child's spiritual development. We don't develop our perspectives on spiritual things in a vacuum. Moms and dads will influence their children either positively or negatively in this area. The good news for moms here listening this morning, is that your influence doesn't have to end when Junior moves out. One of the most famous passages of Scripture regarding what a good woman looks like are the words of a mother found in the last chapter of Proverbs, Proverbs 31. Her name isn't given, but she is credited with the words that Asa read to us here a little bit ago. Though her son received Uh, recorded them, he was careful to note they were the words his mom gave to him. Now, some believe this son to be Solomon, as the name Lemuel signifies one that is for or devoted to God. According to 2 Samuel 12, 24 and 25, David named his first surviving son by Bathsheba Solomon, which means peace. And then God sent a message to David by by Nathan saying, I want you to name him Jedidiah. Jedidiah means beloved of Jehovah. And so Lemuel may have been the endearing name used by his mother, which Solomon here employed to reflect the value he placed on his mother's affections. Observe the teachings of this mother, whoever she was. 
I'm going to read Proverbs 31.1 again, even though Asa's already read it. The words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. Have you ever considered in Proverbs 31 that Lemuel's mother taught him these things? Furthermore, she was so bold as to deliver these admonitions to him even after he was a king. And here they are as the closing to the book of the Proverbs Jews learned and studied for thousands of years, and then Christians for another 2,000 years have also studied and held dear to our hearts. They're the words of a mother to her son, recorded for generations of people to learn from and live by. So, who says the Bible is sexist and male-centered? This whole chapter is delivered by a mother. Granted, her son wrote them down, but he had such a respect for his mother's words, he said, I want you guys to listen to what my mom said. My mama taught me. And chapter 31 is all of what Lemuel's mom, whose name we don't even get, taught him after he was a king. That's significant. Women who have been in Christian circles very long have probably heard reference to the Proverbs 31 woman. How many of you in this room have participated in a Bible study on Proverbs women on Proverbs 31 of the Proverbs 31 woman? Anyone? Any women in here? Have you done a study on Proverbs 31? I need some hands because I I'm okay. That's kind of what I was. We got a couple of you that have done that. I do want to say that. I know that my wife did that. Were you a teenager when you did that still? Before we got married. So she was in her early 20s. And I can tell you for a fact, we've been married 21 years now, that that study that she did before we were ever married has had a profound impact on my wife as she studied what the Proverbs 31 woman, this woman that King Lemuel's mom told him about, looks like. And I suspect that Debbie would say the same thing for herself. And anyone else who's done that, it it sounds like that's a study this church needs to put on for the women. Because only two of you have done this study, or at least who have admitted to it. It's an excellent excellent, uh, admonition. So Lemuel pays homage to his mom here. And Lemuel's mom admonished him in two areas. The second area, verses 10 through 31, which Asa read earlier, is typically the emphasis on Mother's Day and of a woman's Bible study. But verses 2 through 9 are bold instructions from a mother to her son regarding how he should live. Now, as most of the mothers in this present this morning, are in this position, it's instructive to you to remain willing to guide your children regarding their lifestyles even after they become adults. Now, her words are strong. She says, what are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my womb? What are you doing, son of my house? There's strong words. She calls on her authority and reminds him of the mother's right to do so. First of all, he's the son of her womb. So she has a right to speak with the authority and the affection of a parent. Respected 18th century scholar Matthew Henry interprets or translates it this way, interprets the words of this mom. Thou art a piece of myself. I bore thee with sorrow, and I expect no other return for all the pains I have taken with thee and undergone for thee than this. Be wise and good, and then I am well paid. Moms are saying, yep, yep. And that's what Lemuel's mom is saying here. You are the son of my womb. I bore you, and the only payment I need for you to be a good boy, a good man, to follow the Lord. She furthermore has a right to this because he is the son of her vows. 
The implication in this is that she, like Samuel's mother, had vowed to God in connection with the birth of her son. Now, if this is Bathsheba, it's not hard to imagine her pleas and commitments to God following the death of her first son when he was only a few days old. At any rate, she has the right to speak stern words of warning to her son because of her solemn vows to God. Now, a word of warning is in order here for my own children who are present this morning. Because your mom and I made solemn vows ourselves before God. Some of you may have been here, uh, maybe. Some of you may have been here years ago when we dedicated Asa in this church before God. We said, we are going to raise this, this young man as a man of God. And we did that for all four of our children. And so we made those vows before God, and we haven't let up. On, we haven't given up on that. We're not going to. So you guys are just going to have to hang on for a while. And I can guarantee you that if you guys start going astray, we're going to come back to those vows and like this mother say, you, our son or our daughter of our vows, listen up. We made a vow before God to rear you as a godly young man or young woman. And we're going to hold your feet to the fire for that. That's what this mom is doing. So these are the things that Lemuel's mother, uh, the motivation she had to sternly warn her son in his position as king. So she goes on, she gives him these warnings. Beware, roughly translated, of loose women. In fact, she says this. Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy kings. She knew that the wrong woman would destroy him and his effectiveness as a king. And she also told him to beware of strong drink. Verse 4, it's not for kings, O o Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what's been been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Now give strong drink to the one who's perishing and, and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. But you, king, that's not for you. We've all seen the depictions of the fat, drunk kings perverting the, the judgment because they're, they're so tipsy they don't know what's going on. And she says, do not do that, son. Don't pervert those ways. She went on to warn him. Verse 8. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. I would summarize that by beware of biased judgment. She's given those words of warning now. Now this mother turns her attention to what she knows to be vital to her son's success in his position. She's already warned him, stay away from the wrong woman. Avoid those loose women. And then she describes the value of an excellent or virtuous wife. Verse 10, an excellent wife who can find. She's far more precious than jewels. Now, any man who doesn't understand the value of an excellent wife has missed an important life lesson. Men, if you have, you have found a wife, if you've married a woman, you need to praise her. She needs that praise. We're going to see that throughout this, throughout this proverb, this, this repetition of praise your wife, praise your wife, praise your wife. Because she is a valuable asset. She's a jewel. If you found an excellent wife, she's a jewel. Some men might say, well, I didn't, my, my wife's not excellent. She doesn't rise up. <laughs> I don't, I'm off the hook. No, you're not. If you married that woman, there was a time in your life when you saw her as a jewel. You're not off the hook because you think she's not a jewel. She is. A good mother, like Lemuel's mother, 
longs for her son to find this kind of woman that she's going to describe here because she knows it will make or break her son. She sees the value of this wife for her son. Now, I know that my mom prayed for me and my brothers to find excellent wives, and we all managed to do that too, by the way. Now, the rest of this chapter is an alphabetical list describing this virtuous or excellent woman. There's 22 descriptions here. And it's the, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, one by one. So the women listening, remember that this is the standard set forth by a mother who cares for her son. This is the level for which you should strive. And for the unmarried men in this room and listening online, These are the kinds of things you should look for in a potential wife. And again, if you're already married, you need to praise your wife when she strives for and or achieves any of these things. It's one reason we honor mothers on this day. And though they may not all have achieved all of these things at all the time, they are nonetheless far more precious than jewels. No dollar value in spite of what Roger presented to us today, can be put on a virtuous woman. It's far more than $162,000 and however much change it was. Far more than that. No value can be placed on this. The husband and fathers in this audience will attest to that. $162,000 a year? No. That might cover the, just the work that they do. But the value of that woman in my life and in our lives, our lives as men is way beyond anything you can put a dollar on. So too, the children whose mothers fit this description will attest to this fact. More so, as we get older, we understand more and more about that. Now, I'm blessed to have found that excellent wife and to have also had that modeled by my own mother. Both of these women have value beyond description or replacement. The virtuous woman is also trusted by her husband. Verse 11, the heart of the husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She manages the affairs of the home so well that he is not worried about what's going to happen at home when he's out in the fields or when he's out managing the business or otherwise engaged in providing for his household. Him, out on the road, three weeks out of the month. I don't think Kim is worried about what's going on back here at home while he's gone because he knows his excellent wife is managing things. As he's gone, he's not worried about what Susan's doing back here. She is, furthermore, profitable to her husband. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She's committed to to serving him. And as her wedding vows likely stated, until death do us part. She's also a diligent worker. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. You're going to see this this repeated throughout this description of of her her diligence. She's a worker. She's also frugal. She plans ahead for the family's needs. We see this in verse 14. She's like the ships of the merchants. She brings her food from afar. Man, she's busy. I picture the mom who's out shopping, right? She's actively looking for these things. She's going to bring them back to the house so that the family has what's needed. I'm so glad my wife does that because we would be in bad shape if my wife did not do that. I think my dad would say the same thing. If my mom hadn't done those things for my, for, for my brothers and my sister and I, our family would have been up a creek. He's also a responsible manager. 
She rises while it's yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She's laboring hard. She's busy. She's managing things. She rises while it's yet night to provide food for her household and portions, even for the the workers in her house. She's busy. Number seven, she's a wise investor. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. Good grief, this woman's busy. I'm going to, I'm, I got to, I got to make some money here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to buy this land. I, I see, I see some, some potential here. I'm not thinking of Melissa's efforts on this, this farm thing. By the way, that's her idea, not mine. She says, there is this land. Let's do something with that. All right, kids. We're going to till this land. We're going to bring forth fruit for the family. Number eight. She's busy. She doesn't fear hard work. That almost goes without saying by this point. Verse 17. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Number nine. She utilizes her time and talents carefully. Why? To turn a profit. She's not wasting her time. Verse 18, she perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp doesn't go out at night. Many of you guys are aware that uh, with my parents' business, which has been taking off in these last, really about but last year, I guess, really, um, my mom stays up all hours of the night doing this very thing. Her, her light does not go out at night because she's busy trying to get the books caught up. What a, this excellent woman does, this virtuous woman. Number 10, she's versatile and steadfast in her business ventures. Again, we see the emphasis here on, on she's, 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 imp- she's making money. She's busy. She puts her hands to the distaff, and her hands hold the spindle. She's working hard. But it doesn't just end there. She's she's not so self-centered. Verse 20, she opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She cares for those even outside of her home. She has such a heart for them, she reaches out to them too. Verse 21, She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. This is the woman I would say who's preparing for the future. She says, winter's coming. I'm not afraid of it, because my kids all have snow boots, and they got gloves, and they're ready. There's plenty of firewood stacked up and split. We're ready for winter. We've planned ahead. My wife is, is a canning Nut. Say that in a good way. We've got jars and jars and jars of stuff that she's canned over the years. Why? She's ready for winter. One of the reasons she took up this farm thing. Because she says, what? We can't count on always being able to go to the store and get stuff. We need to be able to produce our own stuff. And so she takes that on as she prepares for the future. Number 13, she maintains diligent care of the house. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. So on top of all these other things, she's busy inside the house. Who is this woman? My goodness. Number 14, she works also to maintain the good reputation of the family. This is more implied than anything else in verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She's not dissing her husband. He's out. Oh, well, that's not no account. Oh, I just can't get him to take the trash out. She's not doing that to him. She's praising him. 
number 15. She's industrious. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Now, I originally put disindustrious here, but I added this, including entrepreneurial ventures and other efforts to earn money by her skills. She's, she's looking for these opportunities. She says, I have this skill. I'm going to put it to use. I can make linen garments, and I'll sell them. I'm going to deliver them to the merchants, bring in a little income for the family. Verse 26, or 25, strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She's strong of character. And being strong of character, she also, number 17, teaches that wisdom to other women, and especially her children. Now, I did a little bit of, I took a little bit of license with that conclusion there. Verse 26 actually says, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is in her tongue. You'll see the, the reference there to Titus 2, 3, and 5, where older women are instructed to, uh, to uh, admonish the younger women. Then, verse 27, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She doesn't have time for that. She does not have time to be idle, to be sitting around. She knows the value of time. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness, verse 27. And then we get to verse 28, and this, this, this admonition to the husbands. She's praised by her husband and also by her children. And here we are today, praising these mothers who have done this work, this hard work. Her children rise up, and they call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Men, praise your wife. We praise our mothers. That's somewhat easy. We also need to praise our wives. They need that. They need to hear from us, men. Well done. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for being this woman of excellence. Temptation for men is to see the, all the failures and all the flaws. That's not just men. I mean, that's just kind of human nature. But we need to praise our wives. Children, not off the hook either. Because you're told to rise up and call your mother blessed. Women need this honor. Then verse 29, she surpasses the excellence of other women. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Number 21, she understands the fleeting nature of the physical beauty and pursues the Lord as her primary concern. Verse 30 says, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. There it is again. That admonition, that instruction to praise this woman. Woman who says, My first priority is to fear the Lord. Because she recognizes, hey, this physical beauty one day is going to fade away. And it's not going to matter a hill of beans. But what I've done with Jesus matters. And so we are to praise that in a woman. Number 22. She should be honored and rewarded also for her hard work. Verse 31, the final verse. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. So, when she's been doing all this hard work, it's not just so I can have more stuff and I can sit back and watch more TV. I need to give her those things. I need to say, look, you've done a good job. This is your stuff. Well done. Verse 
give her the fruit of her hands. And let her be praised for what she's doing. Because it also honors the husband. If you guys look at my wife and say, wow, look at all those things she's doing. I'm grateful for that. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about her accomplishments, and I should be. We should be excited about the accomplishments of our wives and children of our mothers. So as we honor our mothers today, we remember the sacrifices they made. If in no other way than physically carrying us in the womb and giving birth to us. We honor those women, again, including those who took on the role of mother in place of a birth mother, who as they reared or are currently rearing us, lived up to even some of the expectations Lemuel's mom laid out for the virtuous woman. So let us remember the motherly advice recorded by her son as the final words of the, of the book of the wise Proverbs in the Bible that stood for thousands of years. Her instructions on right living to her son, even as a king, demonstrate her desire to continue to shape the morality and the success of her son, even in this position of authority. And then, her description of what her son should look for and, and in, an, in an excellent or virtuous wife, stand, not, stand as the high standard for a woman to achieve, but also for a wise man to praise and honor in a woman. And then her clever use of the acrostic to present those characteristics should not hide the fact that the true excellence of a woman is determined not by her charm or her beauty, but by her fear of the Lord. So moms, and my mom in particular, Thanks for all you do to shape the world through your efforts to be women of excellence and virtue as you influence the next generations for the Lord. Thank you, moms, for all that you've done. Let's pray. God, we thank you for giving us these words that you instructed Lemuel to record from his mom. These words that lay out the characteristics of an excellent and virtuous woman, but also demonstrate the the boldness of a mom to speak to her son, to warn her son of the troubles he will be in if he does not avoid, avoid sin and avoid these things that would bring him down. Lord, I thank you for the moms who are here this morning, those who are watching online. Thank you for my mom, for the sacrifices she made in rearing four children. Thank you for the rewards of that, Lord, as I look at my siblings and my own family now, Lord, as the blessing that you have placed on us because of my mom's sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, for seeing that in my own wife as she uh, rears our children and teaches them even at home. Pray, Lord, for strength for my mom, for my wife, for these women in here who are mothers. I pray for those who, I know that uh, those who may long to be moms and maybe have not been able to yet or maybe have never been able to. This can be a very difficult time for them. I pray your your hand on them, Lord. Give even those those women a vision for what you can do through them as virtuous women. And Lord, for those who have recently lost their mothers, or maybe not so recently, who are struggling today, pray your hand of healing on them. And Lord, I just thank you again for the blessings of moms and the way you designed the the family to work. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, Lord, and to worship you and to study your word. May you go with us now as we leave this room and this fellowship. Lord, that we would go out and continue to serve you in all that we do and say. In Jesus' name.
So happy Mother's Day, moms and mom.